neuroscientist who works to understand how neural processes at different skills jointly give rise to cognitive functions such as learning, remembering, and deciding. Kanaka did her PhD at Columbia University, where she already worked on a variety of topics related to emergent properties of neural networks. Uh, in one modern classic she, that she wrote with uh, Larry Abbott, she characterized uh, the dynamics of neural networks with random connectivity under the constraint that individual neurons are either excitatory or inhibitory. She also did a series of studies on uh, the, the mechanisms by which in re recurrent neural networks feature selectivity emerges and We're intrinsic variability and chaos gets spread. Um, and I'm going to plug in my earphone because there's some um, there's some echo, I think. Um, Kanaka completed her postdoctoral training at, at Princeton. In one of her projects there, she studied how sequential activa activation of neurons, such as those observed in uh, working memory, uh, can emerge from random connectivity with minor modifications. And this paper was a great inspiration from for some uh, work in my own lab. Uh, Kanaka started her own lab at Mount Sinai in 2018, and she will be talking today about an exciting new direction that she started there. Uh, the title of her talk is Untangling Brain-Wide Current Flow Using Neural Network Models. Kanaka, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. Um, I, I won't waste um, your time. I just want to get started. Uh, let me share my screen, and hopefully there won't be any um, glitches with this. Let me see. Right, so um, while I have this on play mode, I can't actually see your faces or see the, see the, the chats go by. So uh, Weiji, can you actually tell me if people can hear me? Uh, I can hear you fine. Okay, wonderful. Um, uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction and for giving me this opportunity. Um, it's, you know, I, I was a Schwartz fellow um, many years ago, and I think this is, uh, you know, almost a culmination of this, of this journey. So it's a, it's a great honor for me to be here with you all. Um, and I particularly love the fact that, uh, you know, Yota, Vishwa, and all of the people have taken the Schwartz seminar series and turned them into this open, more democratized model um, and made access possible for so many of us. Um, and, and, and it's really, it's, it's really um, to the, to the broad benefit of the broader neuroscience community. So before I get into my talk, I would like to thank my colleagues and key collaborators on this work, primarily Dr. Matt Perrick, uh, whom some of you have met um, during the journal club that just preceded this talk, uh, Camille spencer Salmon, a graduate student in my lab, um, and, and the rest of my lab. I'd like to also thank my various experimental collaborators, some of whom you see listed here. Uh, today, I'm gonna be talking about an ongoing collaborative project with um, Carl Dyserot's lab at Stanford um, and some experimental data provided by Tyler Benster, who's a grad student there, but also really uh, phenomenal experiments that were performed by Aaron Andelman when he was a postdoc um, in Carl's lab. Um, I would also like to thank my various funding sources for their um, faith in our ideas. Right, so, you know, just to start a little bit broadly than the subject or the, the topic of my um, of, of today's talk, there's a couple of research questions that are of interest to my group, and I thought it would be useful to, you know, solicit feedback on, um, on these ideas more generally, as well as on the subject of, um, of today's talk. So one of the questions that deeply interests me is how does the brain track which task is being engaged in and when it is time to switch? So what do I mean by this, right? So, you know, if I, you know, self-identified as a machine learning person, then I would want to build the smallest possible neural network model that did the most possible number of things, right? Now, this approach ignores a fundamental um, property of the biological brain, which, you know, underlies its ability to multi-purpose function. And that's the ability to track which task is being engaged in and when it's time to switch. And to get at this question, I build multi-purpose RNNs or multi-task RNNs that are constrained from the beginning by data collected in experimental collaborators' labs, but they are behavior level data. And then the theory that, I, that we're currently working on is it, there may be realistic task uh, 
tracking and switching mechanisms that may be dynamical patterns. So for a while, people were recording fixed points in ver various nervous systems. And then after a while, we were recording sequences everywhere. And I've built models of that. And so the theory that we're working on is wherever the state tracker in the brain is located, that has to have steady representation during the performance of a task and has to be able to switch at switch points. And dynamical patterns like fixed points and sequences, and in fact, taking that a little bit further, chaotic neural dynamics, those may be instances of the brain being able to use these types of dynamics as a tracking and switching mechanism. Now, of course, if you kill off these sequentially firing neurons or these fixed point neurons, you fail to perform the experimental task. But the failure may not be for the reason that we think it is. The failure is actually an inability to track the components of these tasks and, and fail, as opposed to the actual units failing that are responsible for the underlying computation. So that's sort of one subject that we're, uh, we're, we're tugging on pretty hard. The other subject, which is going to become the bulk of my talk to you today, is why are there multiple brain areas? And how do multiple brain areas interact to produce cohesive behavior? Said another way, what does this kind of structural and functional modularity that you see in nervous systems, all the way from smaller nervous systems to larger, more complex ones, what do these multiple brain areas, what does this modularity buy you? And to get at this question, we build multi-region recurrent neural network models, and we constrain them directly at the outset by neural data. And then the idea is that we would reverse engineer them because we built them to match these data in for quantities and mechanisms that are not accessible for measurements alone. And so I will give you, you know, much more detail on this on this project today. And what do we mean when, when I say we reverse engineer these models? What do I mean by mechanisms? And what have we discovered when we've applied these types of methods to experimental data collected in the labs of my um, various collaborators? And I've written a few papers on the subject. Right, so we're now experiencing this revolution in experimental neuroscience, right? So we're living in this era of unprecedented neurotechnologies that are you know, capable of recording from many different brain areas at once. We're able to record these neurons or the electrical activity of interacting neurons at cellular resolution over very long periods of time. And you know, you might, your experimental collaborators might collect data that comes out looking like this. Now, you, you know, the, the most common approach would be to take high dimensional data this and do dimensionality reduction on these types of data and start to look at what the essential features of these high dimensional dynamics might be when looked at from the lens of a smaller dimensional space. And so many people have worked on it, including, um, including my postdoc, Dr. Perak, um, has written multiple papers on it. And you know, the, the, this brings us to the notion of these types of dynamical motifs in state space view. So, people will do dimensionality reduction methods and you know you'll get a get a system of of these types of axes and you'll project this activity and it has been found in numerous cases that even in experimental recordings dynamics that are relevant for you know naturalistic behaviors or experimental tasks usually live in manifolds that are smaller dimensional than the total dimensionality possible or, or n. So it lives in manifolds that are less than n dimensions or fewer than n dimensions. And the neural manifold is typically this, this concept of neural manifold is shaped by the covariance between the neurons. Now the covariance is this n by n matrix of the actual outputs that are recorded, much like the spike trains that I showed you in the cartoon before. And that is a covariance, is a, is a property of the actual outputs that are measured and the neural manifold can be and can be described by the axes of these types of covariances. There is, however, a question that remains unanswered, which is what are the inputs that are driving this covariance? So the various inputs that can be that that shape the covariance that then leads to this neural manifold idea are often brain-wide interactions that shape these types of neural manifolds. Now, there are, while people have looked at these covariance matrices, there are a few quantities that are inaccessible from measurements alone, or at least not trivial to get at using current methods. 
Now, what are, what are some of those quantities? We, can't, we don't know exactly the inputs to each neuron from within and across brain areas. So for example, if you pick a neuron in this cartoon area A, and I'm showing you this you know, three region network, um, network in this cartoon, um, area A is, uh, is, is represented by this ball and stick diagram in blue, area B in yellow, and area C in red. And so if I pick a neuron in area A, what are the inputs to that neuron from other neurons in area A versus neurons in B and C. What are the directionality of these interactions and effect of common input? So, you know, are A and B projecting unidirectionally to region C, or is region C acting as a common input to both of these areas, um, area A and B? Are, are all three reciprocally connected to each other? Also, current methods are not really trivial to scale to more than two areas. So what are a few approaches for solving these? These are our needs, right? The need of the field is to be able to address these quantities that are inaccessible for measurements. So one approach, and mine, is to build multi-region recurrent neural network models. And they are constrained directly by neural and behavioral data. I'm hardly the first person to, to do this, take this approach. And in fact, I think Emre Aksa is in the audience today. And you know, his was one of the first few, um, first few papers to take that approach. And it's really foundational. So, you know, to build these models, I build multi-region RNNs, potentially brain-wide. I constrain them directly from the outset by neural and behavioral data. And those data can come from a variety of nervous systems, be it a larval zebrafish, which is an example of a small nervous system in which the sampling is enormous. You can literally see through the animal. And current experimental techniques allow you to measure the activity, electrical activity of every unit in, this, um, in the system system going towards mice, macaques, and even humans. And of course, you know, when we build these models, we also validate them. Um, and I'm going to show you examples of all of those things. And what we do once we build these models is to analyze them using some new methods, as well as methods that have already been used on, on um, experimental recordings. And the goal for us would be to infer circuit mechanisms that are not easy to get at purely experimentally. And so I will show you a few examples of all of these things. Now, if I were a machine learning person, one of the things that you would you know, immediately jump out at you is as you increase the complexity and the size of the nervous system going around this, um, around the schematic, the, the sampling or the access to these nervous systems drops dramatically. So my goal is not to build in the literal sampling ratio that is present in these systems, right? I, I'm not gonna build a billion uh, neuron network model at the cost of, um, of, of a small rainforest and literally sample the number of neurons that are accessible to experimentalists. Instead, today, I will convince you that if, if there are, you know, order of hundreds of neurons from, let's say, between three and eight in, uh, regions in these systems, we can still make circuit mechanistic explanations that are not easy to get at purely experimentally. So using this approach, I've also in my, my lab and I have written a few papers and we have a few papers in prep. That, that you can look at. And I'm happy to you know, talk with um, at least our younger colleagues I'm meeting with um, for an hour after this. So I'm happy to talk about um, any of these ideas. So as a theorist, right, we have the luxury to be able to sit back and ask a question like this. When I look at all of these nervous systems going from smaller, highly sampled nervous systems like the larval zebrafish going up to mice, macaques, and humans, we can really take a step back and ask the following question. Are there any circuit mechanisms that are conserved when you go from one nervous system to the other? And this is really a fundamental need of humanity, right, is to be looking at these types of unifying threads and identifying where the key divergences lie. Both of those questions are super interesting to me. Um, however, for today's purpose, what I, wanna, uh, what I wanna do is narrow this down a little bit. So how do we build these multi-region RNNs, right? The first thing we do is to take a single module recurrent neural network. The RNN here stands for um, recurrent neural network and you keep seeing that everywhere. Now, you know, in a, in a very simple manner, these types of networks can be understood by understanding some kind of continuous time varying output from each of these model units and the strength with which they all couple to each other, which I've labeled here recurrent connections. And, you know, models like this have been idealized uh, with random connectivity. They've also been studied in multiple other scenarios by a very large group of theoretical neuroscientists, including my own self. But what we do now is the ability to 
to wire multiple RNNs like this together and create a multi-region RNN. So here in this cartoon, I'm showing you an RNN A in blue, RNN B in yellow, and RNN C in red that are wired by also recurrent connections, but I'm just labeling these ones inter-area projections. So in, you know, when you talk about the class of firing rate models, then these types of models have a certain mathematical tractability or elegance to them. And that elegance comes from the fact that you can understand a lot about the general properties of matrices of, of networks like this by looking at the actual connectivity or the connectivity weights within this network. So for a single module RNN, that can be summarized by a directed interaction matrix, which if the network had n neurons has n squared entries in it, the columns are the presynaptic um, uh, presynaptic units and the rows are postsynaptic units. And every entry in the matrix tells you how strongly every neuron in this network is coupled to every other neuron. Now, you know, matrices like this are, you know, fascinating to probably across the neuroscience community to a lot of people. In multi-region RNNs, the same directed interaction matrix now acquires a slightly more interesting shape. It allows us to look at connections within each region, as you see in the slightly denser blocks in this cartoon matrix that I've drawn, as well as connections across these areas by looking at these blocks, for instance, the blocks that are on the off-diagonal elements. Now, no that I'm not talking about physical synapses here or physical or anatomical um, synaptic connectivity here. This is because, because networks like this are very powerful. They can match time varying time series from data of any kind of resolution. So you can think of you know, building these models to match things like EEGs or LFPs. In that case, what we're capturing is sort of global features of functional connectivity that are manifested in the dynamics. This is why we thought we'd keep the terminology general and call it directed interactions, as opposed to calling it something like synaptic connections, which evokes a literal anatomical connection. So, so the first thing we did was to go from single module RNNs to multi-region RNNs. The second thing we can do is to train the activity of model units to match neural data directly. And so what we do is to use a learning rule that is a target-based learning rule. So here again, I've drawn this cartoon here, RNN A, B, and C. Each of these is a recurrent neural network, and that's wired together by these inter-area projections. So when you wire up a multi-region model like this, and everyone's connected with random weights that have not been changed in any way, the activity of each unit in the model which which I'm showing you in this red squiggle here and symbolized by the term ZI is some irregular time series, right? Which I've plotted here. Now, what we end up doing with the training algorithm is to recursively, that is at every time step, match its activity to a target function that can be derived directly from data. So these can be, you know, normalized spike counts, which, you know, if the, if the spike counts are slow enough can be thought of as a firing rate, we can derive, uh, we can derive targets from calcium data. And as I said, we can do this with, date, with any sort of continuous time varying data so far as we have enough of it. And so at every time step, the learning error is the linear difference between what the activity of each unit is at that time point and where it wants to go based on a target. And that drives the update for the entire matrix at every time point. So, you know, biologists in the crowd will immediately know this is not a realistic learning rule or a plasticity mechanism, and we're not making that claim either. All we're doing is can we design a Lego model that can, you know, I don't know, make like the Death Star and look like the Death Star. And that's what this training algorithm is meant to do. So the first thing we did, as I said, was to take a single module RNN and then convert it into multi-region RNN by just attaching more of them together. The second thing we do is to train the activity of each model unit to match neural data directly. So what does this exercise buy you, right? And, you know, and in the examples that I'm going to show you today, we're going to be using networks that are the same size as the size of the experimental data set. Everyone needs a target in, the, in this formalism. But we've also played with examples where we've built a much larger network and only targeted a few of the neurons um, within, this, within this largely unstructured milieu. We've also done the game where we've taken a network that is fully trained like this one and embedded it into a much larger unstructured milieu. And those are all possible. 
And as I said, you know, we're not here to mimic the exact uh, partial sampling issue that is present across nervous systems. So for today's talk, I'm going to be restricting myself to networks in which the size of the network is given, is almost dictated by the size of the experimental data set that I'm interested in getting it to match. So what does this activity buy you, right? It buys you three things. The first thing it buys you, so the outputs from these models are realistic neural dynamics, which I have given in this set of phi of xi. So every neuron produces some kind of neural dynamics that are consistent with the experimental data from which the targets were derived. So now this is only a small sized whoop because, you know, people that know recurrent neural networks in the crowd will know that these are very powerful models and can really be trained to, I mean, I could get these networks to write my name in cursive. So yes, this we can do. The thing that is that you cannot get from experiments alone is the ability to look inside the model and so that's what allows us to infer consistent brain-wide recurrent interactions or these directed interactions, which I'm symbolizing here by the matrix J trained. That piece is not something, it's, it's like a functional connectivity piece that you couldn't get from trivially from measurements alone. And I'm happy to, you know, maybe pause here if there's any questions about this, because I'm gonna get to the third piece, which I which which is what the subject of the of the re remainder of the talk is going to be. So if there are was, questions, you need to speak up. Yeah, there was there was one uh, question posted uh, a little bit earlier, which is, are the time constants of each unit set beforehand? Can they be learned along with the connection weights? That is a fantastic question. So the time constants here, we're not making them plastic. They certainly can be. So here we're just initializing them based on, you know, what we want the, you know, what the effective time constant of the data to be at. But yeah, every unit in this model can have its own time constant, which can also be made plastic. I think there are people who have done this. And Tim Fogels comes to mind as somebody who may be on the paper who has done that, not in the context of training to match data. So and, and it's a good idea because you might you may be able to infer something that is, uh, you know, quite qualitatively similar to one of XJ Wong's papers on the hierarchy of timescales. So what we want to do is have multi-region models in which each module has a characteristic time constant, and that is learned opportunistically by the network. So if we don't arrive at the failure mode in which everybody just slams to one tau, one characteristic tau, this might act, the, the data might be constrained enough for us to extract something like that. Did that answer your question? I, I have no visual feedback, so. No, so I, uh, let's, let's just continue, thank you. Okay, got it. So, you know, you can get, you know, realistic neural dynamics once the models are trained, they can autonomously produce neural dynamics that are similar to data, which is not surprising. The surprising thing is being able to infer consistent brain-wide directed interactions, which remember if you saw in the cartoon before, tells you the interactions within each area as well as interactions between areas. The third piece, which is really the piece that you can get from experiments and the piece that I'm super excited about is the ability to compute currents due to recurrence, which is the dot product of this matrix with the activations either produced by the data or either produced by the model or the data. And by summing over this little j, we can look at source currents to each area, either the ones that are driving the neurons within an area or currents that are driving the neurons in an area from other regions. And I'm going to show you what that looks like in a second. So here's a multi-region uh, um, region network that, again, I've you know, written in this cartoon form. Region A, that's written in this RNNA, region B in yellow, and region C in red. And you know, the process of training gives us this you know, J-trained matrix that along its principal diagonal, in blue are the connections within A, in B are the directed interactions within region B, and in red are the directed interactions within region C, as well as the interactions going from B to A and C to A. Those are the two objects that we have by just fitting the model, right? The dot product of these two gives us currents due to recurrent interactions. And this is a piece that you cannot get from experiments alone. And that's why we call this current-based decomposition of population activity, or CURT, because we're now able to take dot products based on only the relevant indices of J. So for example, we can look at the currents received by A, by a neuron in A, by other neurons in A, by just summing this over, over all the neurons in region A, we can do the same for B and same for C. And I'll show you that in a second. 
So let's say you know you have you have this exercise. Um, you you're able to do this method on recordings. So let's say your experimental colleague gave you experimental data. Here's a single neuron, and this is from an idealized um, idealized ground truth style data set, just to visually show you the idea of what this method can do. So I've plotted here something like the firing rate of one neuron in this RNNA, one neuron in region B or RNNB that has this kind of you know almost like a wave-like thing, and one that, uh, and a single neuron in region C that has kind of a fixed point-like thing that goes to another fixed point-like thing there. So I'm deliberately picking these examples um, based on, on Matt's simulation so, that, so as to give our eyes something to look at. What CURB can do is to take the recordings or the actual recorded output of this, of this region A and decompose it into the source currents. And it's able to tell you what the currents are that drive A from other neurons in region A by just summing this little j over neurons in A versus what are the currents that are driving neurons in region A from region B and also the currents from region C to region A. Now, since this is just a linear decomposition, the sum of these three gives you the recorded output in the first place. But without this matrix that you inferred by fitting the RNN, you wouldn't be able to do this decomposition in the first place. And so that's, you know, that's sort of the flavor of this method. And, you know, like when we develop most methods, we want to validate this method first on idealized, synthetic, you know, surrogate generated ground truth style data. And that's what I'm going to show you next. So, you know, here's again RNN A, B, and C connected reciprocally. And what I'm going to show you here on the left of this picture, left of the slide, is a generator model. So I'm going to generate myself some ground truth style data, and I'm going to drive um, RNN B with a sequential input. So each neuron here, each neuron in region B receives one of these time traces. So this is one input. It has a fixed point, has a sequence, and then goes to another fixed point. RNN C in red is being driven by this fixed point that goes to another fixed point. And RNN A is only receiving recurrent um, inputs from these two regions, but it's not actually explicitly being driven by these external inputs. So, you know, these are highly idealized because I want you all to have something to look at. Now, in reality, inputs that are driving nearby regions may be correlated to different extents, and they may, you know, they may have more the flavor of filtered white noise or more biologically realistic inputs, but those are hard to show on a slide, so I'm picking these ones. So here is the here is the simulated outputs from from this uh, generator model. So here is firing rates of neurons um, as a function of time. I believe there's a thousand in each. So region I'm and then parameters are specifically picked to give you these types of dynamical patterns, and they're connected with less dense connections with uh, between areas than within areas. So this is a generator model. So neurons in region A produce something that is reminiscent of irregular, highly variable, almost chaotic activity. Region B looks kind of sequential because you wanted, I wanted it to be able to reflect the external input. And region C has this sort of fixed point like flavor that goes to another fixed point at this particular time point. Now what we want CURB to do, so now we have a model that is that is intended to fit this generator model. The model on the left was produce, was producing idealized ground truth data. So we now take a second RNN, a fully connected one, mind you. We're not telling it to find three regions. And we fit its activity, which is initially irregular, to each of these. So this model RNN will now have 3,000 units, or as many units as in the simulated data set. And the exercise of fitting this model, as I told you, gives you this directed interaction matrix, right, with presynaptic as the, uh, or, or the or the sources and the targets, if you will. And then across the diagonals are connections within RNNA, within RNNB, and within RNNC, and so forth. Now, the outputs of this of this network model, right, which is the actual activations of each unit in this model RNN, do look a lot like the generator model. And they already told you these models are very powerful. So dynamics like this are not that hard for models like this to fit. So first of all, the, we didn't tell the model that there are three regions and we should find three different dynamical patterns, but there that is, right? So RNN A, B, and C look a lot like the generator model's um, actual outputs. But what CURBED allows us to do is to just take the activity 
of region A. And if you do this exercise of, of doing these dot products correctly, you get the currents from A to A in this first box in blue, currents from B to A that actually reflect the sequential nature of the inputs that were only driving region B, and currents from C to A that have this sort of fixed point-like flavor. So the sum of these three will still give you something that you would experimentally record from region A. But you are now able to, by virtue of this matrix, decompose it into these component or source currents through this curved exercise. Now, we've also, you know, quantified how well we're doing with this. The other thing that we can do is, you know, I, I showed you these, uh, you know, um, dynamical motifs in the beginning, which are obtained by doing, you know, dimensionality reduction on recorded outputs. We can also do the same exercise on these subcurrents. So the source currents that we've now been able to demix can also give us coordinate spaces into which we can project the activity and now get an alternative view. Now, this picture by itself doesn't tell you much, but when I apply it to real data, and I'll show you that in about couple of slides, I can, um, I, I'll be able to actually convince you that this is a powerful alternative to current, um, current ways of looking at um, looking at things. So now we can also look at these currents as a function of time, because if we can look at these, um, you know, state space views as a function of time. So here are the same three currents that are derived in the previous slide, but now we've plotted them, you know, sort of vertically. So from currents from A to A, now on the right hand side is the PC, the first principal component as a function of time. In dashed lines is the ground truth, which I've obtained from the picture on the left or the simulated ground truth data. And you can see that the that curve actually recovers the currents that are quite similar to the ground truth. So currents from B to A in yellow also match the ground truth, the respective ground truth. It even has the kinks in sort of the right place. And then in the and then currents from C to A in red also have this fixed point that then transitions to this other fixed point, which was the intent. We can also quantify how well these models do. And we've done various other types of sampling analyses and figuring out its failure modes and like that. Um, and they are in the they're in the paper if you would like to look at them. But here are here's the R squared value. And if you compare to the sequence, you see that a B to A has a higher a B to A currents have a higher R squared compared to a sequence, and C to A as higher R squared compared to the fixed point. We can also look at it in the variance explained fraction um, fraction way. But let's return to this picture for a second, right? Where do we want this method to go? And before I get into the meat of the slide, I would like to take another beat and ask if there's any pressing questions before we move on. Uh, right now, there are no questions posted. Cool. So um, in terms of, so we've, I've just shown you what happens if we, you, you know, run this method or, you know, uh, validate this method or idealized ground truth data set. So where are we going with this, right? What we would love for this method to be able to do is to really do in vivo tracked tracing. I, what we want this method to be able to do is to identify whether a recording, let's say somebody hands you a grab bag of neurons over time, is that recording from a single area or multiple distinct areas? Is there a dynamical difference between these areas that you've you know, collected the outputs from? Is there a structural difference between these areas that you've collected the data from? And if there's different types of inputs each area receives. So we're not quite there 100% of all of these, but that's where this method is going to go. Is in vivo track tracing. So, you know, what I want to do next is to show you this method actually working on real biological data collected from the larval zebrafish system. It's a convenient segue from a highly sampled idealized ground truth to something that's a highly sampled brain. So now I want to introduce experiments performed by Aaron Andelman, a very talented postdoc in Carl Dyserot's lab. It's an ongoing collaboration of ours and a long-term collaboration. And you know we're, we're very fortunate to be in this position to have very high quality data. And so the experiment that Aaron Andelman designed involved head fixing larval zebrafish and you know uh, giving them little electrical shocks. And so that's what I've, I have drawn in the simplified schematic here. So here's a control uh, larval zebrafish. Here's a larval zebrafish to which this challenge period involves giving a tiny amount of shock at some kind of intervals 
for a long period of time. So initially when the shocks come on, larval zebrafish will whip their tail quite heavily. They can't escape because they're head fixed, but they'll whip their tails because they find this aversive and it's a vigorous evasive response. And that's often in this type of work known as active coping, that response. Now, of course, they can't escape because the shocks keep coming. It's an open loop kind of paradigm. And, you know, they're head fixed. So the fish perceive this, we think, as persistent and inescapable stress. And this is a phrase that I'm going to return to over and over again. This perception of the stress being persistent and inescapable drives the animal, we think, into passive coping or a state when it says, screw it, I'm not swimming anymore. So there's an active coping phase and a passive coping phase, and this has been seen in multiple different nervous systems. So here we've quantified the tail whip velocity as a function of time for control fish in black, and this is five individuals, um, and shocked fish in blue. And, you can, and in pink, this bar shows you the duration of the behavioral challenge period. So you can see that you know when the shocks first come on, there's an elevation in this tail whip velocity indicating this active coping, because fish just want to vigorously evade the stressful response. Now, because the stress is persistent and inescapable, eventually the fish laps into the state where the tail whip velocity drops below that of the control in black, and that's the passive coping phase. Now, because, you know, and in addition to these types of behavioral data, we also have access to high quality uh, multi region imaging data cellu at cellular resolution from these fish. So they've actually expressed uh, nuclear localized GCAM, so any ROI that glows, we think, is a, is a an actual neuron, different neurons in the larval zebrafish brain. And that's what you see here, the heads on the left of this picture, the tails on the right of this picture. And they're able to practically image the entire brain of this larval zebrafish system. And so we have between 10,000 to 40,000 neurons, along with this kind of behavioral sampling in this data set. And so that really, this experimental system really lends itself to the kinds of models that I just introduced. So what we want to do ultimately is to be able to extract mechanisms and principles from smaller brains with more access. So that's what I'm showing you here is this little, you know, larval zebrafish and try and extrapolate those principles in a systematic way to brains that have some homologies with them, but where the same level of access is not present. So the larval zebrafish system was fascinating for, for, for a few reasons, least of which was the ability to image everybody in it, but also because it has homologies with the mammalian system. So one of the systems in which this kind of active coping and passive coping has been studied in stressful scenarios or experimental paradigms is the mouse system. And there's a lot of number of papers that I'm sure I'm missing quite a few that have uh, that have studied uh, the mouse neurobiology impact, passive coping and similar states. But the fish has some homologies. And in particular, I want to draw your eye to this nucleus that is labeled habenula and this nucleus that is labeled raphe. Both of these systems have those nuclei, except now in the larval zebrafish system, you have more access to it. Right. So, you know, we return to our experimental system and, you know, there are a few findings that just kind of leapt out from the measurements alone. Right. And, you know, this is uh, this is in our 2019 paper. So there's a few neural findings that Aaron could pull out from the data. So we knew what we were looking for because we knew we wanted to look in the habenula. And so what Aaron found was that there's a steady increase in the activation of the habenula as a function of the stress. So here I'm showing you the calcium fluorescence averaged over multiple individuals as a function of time. In black is control and in blue is the shocked condition. And in both nuclei of the of the habenula and mind you for the RNNs, we're kind of lumping them together. And you know, we can discuss the pros and cons of that later. But you know, the suffice to say that the shocked fish um, in in blue show a sort of a steady ramp like um, a steady ramp as a function of the stress. In dashed line is the time point at which the shocks start to go in. Now, concomitantly with this steady increase, Aaron also found suppression of activity in the raphe, which is known to be downstream of the heaven. Now, let me tell you the story that we constructed in our heads, right? What we wanted to do as theorists is, well, look for something like a mechanism. What does a mechanism mean in this case? So what we know from mammalian literature is something like the story that I'm about to tell you. Bad stuff happens, and the habenula is the quetcher. It says bad stuff's happening, bad stuff's happening, bad stuff's happening. It sends a projection to the raphe, which dumps a bunch of serotonin into the system and says, cavalry's here, I hope you feel better. 
Now, if that didn't make you feel better, then to avoid shock, you have to go into passive coping. So somebody has to be able to shut down the movement. That's what we started looking for. So what is the mechanism by which the story that I just told you unfolds? So the question we wanted to look for is, is there a store, is there a cortex in the larval zebrafish system responsible for shutting down the movement? Like there is in the mammalian system, the infralimbic cortex could be a region that is responsible for shutting down movement when the same phenotype is seen in, in the mammalian system. I'll already tell you this is not what we found, but en route to it, we found other mechanisms that we didn't have access to from, uh, from either measurements or other models. So what we do now is to build a model. And this, you know, the, I apologize, the things on the right should really appear slowly. They've just kind of popped over there. So the first thing we do is to exactly by the recipe that I told you before, build multi-region models of the larval zebrafish brain. And indeed in the paper that we're about to put on BioArchive, we've looked at brain-wide interactions between you know, 13 interacting regions in the, in the larval zebrafish brain. But I want to be able to give you a really in-depth feel for what these these models can do. So I'm bringing the system down to a three region RNN model of the neural dynamics. And that's what you see here on the left. Area A, because we're guided by the experimental intuition, is supposed to look like a habenula. Area C in red is a raphae-like module. And then since we were looking for something that was like the infralimbic cortex, what better to think about than a conveniently named telencephalon block? So we took data from a telencephalon in these imaging data sets, and we made that area B, which you see in yellow. And this is where those three regions are. Now, the habenula isn't a subpart of this. It's kind of on a different z-plane. But those are the three regions in the, in the map of the larval zebrafish. And here's another cartoon that shows you that those are those three regions. What we then do is to take the activity of each unit in this model, which would initially be kind of random and you know uh, poorly correlated with one another, and train it to match the data directly. And this works. So here's one neuron in the habenula in blue as a function of time. In gray is the data that made the target for this particular RNN unit. In red is a raphae-like RNN unit. And in yellow is a telencephalon-like RNN unit. And you can see that you know it, it kind of misses, the network misses these sort of high frequency bits, but gets the overall dynamics right. And just to convince you that I didn't cherry pick these three examples in particular, we can also do state space analysis. So the exact same uh, dimensionality reduction techniques we can do on the networks outputs as we can do on the data. And that gives you, and I'm just showing you the results of a, of a simple principal component analysis here. Here's an axis spanned by the dominant three principal components. In gray are the data. And in red is the models outputs. And you can even here, you can see that, you know, there are these little idiosyncrasies as well as these high frequency bits that the model misses, but you get the overall dynamics right. And you can also look at how many principal components can, you know, can explain 90% of the variance. And you do see that the model, once again in red, is not trying to fit every little bump and wiggle, but just trying to get the dynamics right. So yes, it's overfit, but not so badly that you can't do anything with this with this model. But again, right, as people, RNN aficionados amongst you will know, these are powerful models, so this is only a medium-sized one. What these models really allow us to do that you can't any other way is to be able to look at these directed interactions or these recurrent interaction matrices. And that reveals connectivity changes brain-wide. Right? So those the trained matrix, here I'm plotting the log probability density of J trained or this entire matrix that you infer from the network as a function of interaction strength. I'm taking a, a, the log, uh, log on the y-axis because the ranges were enormous. And I'm also normalizing everybody so that your eye has something again to look for in this graph. So or what, one thing that just jumps out by looking at the bulk properties of or the statistical properties of groups of these weights rather than individual weights is that compared to control, which is the gray histogram, the blue histogram tells you the interaction strengths or the directed interactions brain wide in the in the shocked fish. And in that case, you can see that there's an expansion in the, in, the, in the range of these weights. Now, since all of these matrices that we're finding in the larval zebrafish case are centered at zero, that means that, the, that what is reflective of a change is really the variance or the second moment of these distributions. 
The other thing that jumps out is the fact that they all seem to be making an exponential sort of distribution in this um, exponential class of distributions. And so for people that like random matrices, uh, since it's a theoretical neuroscience talk, if the initial random matrix would be like a little Gaussian bump because it's normalized by, um, the variance is normalized by you know, G squared over N. So you will see that it's actually a little Gaussian over here, but really post training, these matrices acquire this sort of heavy tailed exponential um, feel. And this is a feature that we see in multiple, but not all um, RNNs, which is that rather than being driven by random interactions throughout, network tuning in these systems seem to be driven by rarer and stronger interactions brain-wide. So now this matrix also allows us to be able to decompose it into different bits. And we were interested particularly starting with the Habenilo and the Raffae because all of this literature drives us in that direction. And we were looking for the cortex, remember? So we can look at these distributions within the key sub matrices. And just to give your eye something to look at, I've actually marked them in this in the schematic here. So this is connections within the habenula. This is connections from the raffae to the habenula. This is connections within just the raffae. And this is connections from the habenula to the raffae. So these are interactions. So not, su not super surprisingly to those of you who work in these types of biological systems, that big change that you saw in the matrix, in the bulk matrix, seemed to largely be driven by changes within the habenula. So this started to get us something that is like the dreaded M word, right? The mechanism word. So we knew we were looking for something that caused this ramp. And so the theory was maybe this ramp or the activation, hyperactivation in the habenula could be driven by strengthening of projections within the habenula. Again, in gray is the shocked fish and in blue is an RNN, um, RNN that's been fit to, uh, sorry, in, in gray is the control fish and in blue is an RNN that's been fit to, to shocked fish. And you can see that there is indeed a strengthening of these interactions within the habenula. We, can't, we didn't really see a huge amount of difference in the habenula to raffae projections. We didn't really see a huge amount within the raffae, except maybe if I decouple my eyeballs, I can kind of hallucinate that this blue is a little bit narrower than the gray. But really, the unexpected change was in the raffae to habenula projections. So note I told you there was an interact, there is an anatomical projections from the habenula to the raffae. But this projection that reflects some kind of feedback interaction from the raffae to the habenula was something that was an unexpected finding for us. And this was the second key piece that made the foundations, um, foundations of this paper and is currently being, um, currently being verified experimentally. Now, this raffia to habenula projection that I'm talking about doesn't have to be an anatomical connection. It is, you know, it could be an indirect uh, non-monosynaptic interaction. It could be reflective of the, you know, the fact that the raffia dumps serotonin brain-wide and says, I hope you feel better. But these are the interactions that are then manifested in the dynamics of the system that may explain why you see the experimental observations you do. Again, this elevates you to a medium level understanding. Really okay. what we want to do, um, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, but there are several yes. questions now. Would you prefer sure. to take Wait, them now or later? This is a very good place to ask. OK, so uh, one question is, are estimated output currents from all neurons either or excitatory or, or inhibitory? So do they follow Dale's law? So, so you the, the question has only one word that I would switch out. Are the neurons in the model uh, restricted to excitatory and inhibitory? They're not. So in it, we initialize them to be sort of any which way they want. They're Gaussian IID at the beginning. We don't restrict them to come out that way either. What we can do is to either take the uh, excitatory elements as the positive entries in the matrix, inhibitory elements as the negative entries in the matrix, we can also do that in the current space. But we don't impose that a priori. We probably ought to. Um, the next question is uh, related to the previous part. So if you only train a subset of the RNN to match a subset of the ground truth, how well do the remaining parts match? So, okay, so this is, this is a question. Well, first of all, it's a very good question. So this depends on the richness of the dynamics that you're trying to match. 
So obviously for these types of models, I'll give you the answer that anyone that works in neural networks does. The flippant answer is, yeah, more is better. But we have done some of these subsampling kind of exercises in the supplemental figures to, to the curved paper. And we've seen that if we train everybody but only subsample a few, you still get fidelity to you know about 50% or so before that drops off. Now, you know, it depends, as I said, it depends on the dynamics. So in my 2016 paper, I had shown that you can you need to only train like 8% of the weights within uh, within a network in order to be able to generate something simple like a time varying, you know, 2D sequence. Um, and so it really kind of depends on how complex the activity is and how many principal components of it that you're trying to match. Then uh, are the inter-aerial connections always sparser and weaker than the intra-aerial connections in the trained RNNs? So we don't impose them in the in the RNNs that we're fitting to data. So we wanted to listen, we wanted to do the first order thing first. We wanted to say how much constraints are there in the typical experimental data set that maybe this effect will just pop out. That would be the dream scenario, right? This is a highly sampled nervous system. Everybody has a target. So the dream scenario would be that if we looked at the, 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 the probability of connections within areas versus between areas, one of them would just show up as being sparser than the other. And that has not happened. So what we want to do next is to actually freeze some of the inter-area weights. So we want to put in either anatomically known constraints. And this came up um, in, the, in the journal club that was very beautifully led by um, one of the NYU graduate students, Claudia Olegovna. And she brought this up as one of the suggestions at the end of her journal club as well, which is that maybe putting in those types of anatomical constraints will strengthen these models. Right now, we don't have those. Um, there's somebody who wonders how well the method would work uh, if the neurons uh, were to be undersampled from a bigger brain. Yeah, so it's a similar type of uh, type of question than the one you asked before, right? So we have done these types of exactly this type of um, inference technique on pseudo population data from macaques. It's in the paper. We've also done this on human data. All of them are extremely, extremely undersampled compared to the to the to the whole brain. Um, I'm also working um, in a different in, in an entirely different system. In fact, having neurons in the network that don't have target functions helps when you're trying to perform complex tasks. So in the first topic that I sort of mentioned and then didn't totally go into, if the complexity of the task needs to be ramped up, then models like this, and this is you know unpublished work that we're still trying to you know wrap our heads around, having neurons that are unstructured, that are not trained to be very task specialized, seems to help in, per, in, in, in performance. And I'm trying to understand if this is a trivial effect of just having more current in these types of networks, or is there something more subtle going on in the heterogeneity? And finally, for the moment, um, uh, one questioner is uh, worried about uh, potential overfitting. So is there anything you could say more about uh, out of sample cross validation based mm -hmm. on the train network? So these are overfit. The examples I'm showing you today are overfit because the purpose for us is to get a first order idea of, you know, what types of inferences can we make by fitting these networks faithfully to the data without putting in any biases up front. And can we come up with some kind of consistency measure? So let's say I started with a completely different random initial condition or used a slightly different learning rule. Will I still get the same sort of distribution? And that seems to have held true for now. So next step for us would be to definitely do this kind of cross-validation. So again, the more data we have, the better we're able to cross-validate um, these types of models. But the results I'm showing you today are definitely over. Thank you. We'll go to the next round of questions later. Cool. Right. So, you know, I told you a little bit about how we can extract, you know, activity that is produced by this dynamical system that is consistent with experimental observations. I told you that we're now able to look inside the hood of this network and extract properties of these uh, of these types of interaction matrices. And those are informative about, you know, general properties. They may be able to help us write down plasticity mechanisms sometime in the future. We're not there yet but they're able to inform us about mechanisms that you couldn't get from measurements alone. But really the thing I'm excited about is sort of the juxtaposition of those two objects. This matrix of interactions or directed interactions and the actual outputs. 
And so in the case of Habenula, we want to keep this Habenula centric because we knew that the story that we were trying to construct. So that exercise of doing curved that I just explained to you, that gives you three different currents. So you can actually run curved on the outputs measured in the, in the Habenula in conjunction with a matrix that you obtain by fitting all three regions. And you can get a Habenula to Habenula current that is shown here, Raffi to Habenula current that's shown here, and a T-lencephalon to Habenula current shown here. The sum of these three will still give you what you recorded in the first place. So this exercise really gives you a within area current because you're doing this dot product with just the interactions within the habenula, as well as two inter area currents in terms of the raffi to habenula current and the telencephalon to habenula current that you couldn't get from experiments alone. So what used to be one output of 2200 habenula units can now be decomposed into three component currents. And Matt has sorted these neurons in the habenula to habenula subspace just to give our eyes something to look at, but the sorting is irrelevant to the, to the actual results. And the other two current plots follow the same indexing as this one. The three of the currents that I just showed you add up to the measured output. And so, you know, the total activity in the habenula, and it's, this one is also sorted, and I'm only showing you 120 of those 2,200 neurons as a function of time. Or you can look at the, you know, the average population activity as well, and that showed the ramp. So where we're going with this is to be able to propose this current-based point of view as an alternative to the traditional point of view of looking at these types of activity, such as you know, either sorting the activity or you know, doing an average of the activity over different individuals. What we also can do, and to me, that's the biggest strength of this method that you couldn't do anyway else, is a state space view. So you could do PCA on the measured outputs, but you can also do PCA in this current space. And that gives you three axes because you can take the dominant principal component in each of these current spaces. And that gives you in blue, a habenula to habenula axis in blue, raffi to habenula axis in red, and a telencephalon to habenula axis in yellow. Now we can take the output, either experimentally recorded output or the RNN's output, and project it into this new coordinate space. And, and we've also put dots to symbolize the times at which the shocks are delivered to the animal. And remember what we went looking for. We went looking for an effect that was habenula driven, because that was supposed to be the region that said bad stuff's happening, bad stuff's happening, bad stuff's happening. Instead, what we found was that the early effects, which are this bad stuff happening narrative, that is driven by currents in the raffi to habenula space. And it's only later that the habenula, habenula, and telencephalon to habenula subspace get, get populated. And there seemed to be this clear separation of timing in these inter-area currents. So where, so before I tell you what these look like as a function of time, I can tell you where we're going with this, right? What we want to be able to do is to propose inter-area effects like this one, like the timing effect from curved, as a powerful alternative to the traditional point of view. The traditional point of view would have, you know, just look at the output, uh, look at the behavioral output, and correlate it with the measured neural activity. But this gives you a slightly more unique view into it in that, the active coping phase in the behavior, characterized by an increase in the tail whip velocity over time in the acute or early phase of the stressful experience, may be driven by rotations in the raffi to habenula subspace, and not as we had originally thought in the habenula habenula space. Now, this is, a, is at least a complementary um, alternative to the traditional point of view, which could involve sorting the activity that is experimentally recorded, averaging the population activity over multiple individuals, and activity that is projected into the dominant principal components. So here's the activity of the habenula now being projected into the dominant principal components. And you see that this sort of clear, um, you know, time scale difference is sort of mushed in this, in this, um, in this, albeit smooth trajectory. So what we're proposing this method to, to all our experimental collaborators, we have a few examples in the paper, but we're always looking for more people to adopt these types of methods, is that it's a complement to these types of points of view to get at mechanisms that you wouldn't be able to get at trivially otherwise. So what do these currents look like as a function of time? So here I'm plotting input currents for the control fish as a function of time, and these get a little dense, so bear with me. 
So what we're doing is we're taking the actual tail movement of the fish. So every time the tail of the fish whips, it breaks a light beam. And that entire thing gives you a vector of zeros and ones. We've convolved that vector of zeros and ones with a Gaussian just again for visualization purposes so our eye has something to look at. And that's what's plotted in black here. In red is a Raffae to Habenula current. In blue is the Habenula Habenula current. And in yellow is the Telencephalon to Habenula current. And all three kind of look more or less the same. They seem to be following one another. The story is different when you look at the same current in a control fish. So this is currents that are extracted from an RNN that has been fetched data from fish that have been shocked with the times that are represented by these dots. Again, warm colors indicate early shocks and late um, shocks or later in the experiment is actually given by these, uh, by these colder colors. And here, once again, in black is the tail whip um, or is a tail whips as a function of time. And you see that eventually the fish dust laps into the state where there's a, there's, you know, very low or kind of zero tail whips. This is not even a particularly good shocked fish because, you know, it makes this exploratory tail whip after lapsing into passivity. In this, the currents are much more clear. So you see that the early or the active coping phase is driven by a ramp in the Raffae to Habenula subspace, or that current seems to ramp early. And it's only later on, perhaps even after the lapse in passivity, that the Habenula, Habenula, and the Telencephalon to Habenula current starts to go up. And this effect is conserved even when we average over RNNs that have been fit to multiple individual fish, which is a powerful finding for us. So in control fish, now this is average over five individuals. Once again, you see that these three currents, Habenula, Habenula in blue, Raffae to Habenula in red, and Telencephalon to Habenula in yellow. They seem to mirror one another. But in shocked fish, the Raffae to Habenula subspace comes on early. Those, the active coping may be driven more by rotations in this current space. And it's only later on that these other two currents in the Habenula, Habenula, Antilencephalon to Habenula subspace start to ramp up. Now, to really convince you that there are two different things happening, what we also ended up doing was to look at the actual directed interactions in these different phases. And so that's what I'm going to show you now. So this is directed interaction changes during the experiment. And the, the submatrix of interest that I want to draw your eye to is this Raffae to Habenula block, because that's the piece that I wanted to disentangle. So here's the log probability density as a function of interaction strength for three different epochs of this experiment. In gray is the baseline period, a six minute chunk of the experiment. In red is the early phase of the shock. And you see that those two distributions are quite similar, if not identical. And later on, in, in fact, in the early epochs is when the changes in the dynamics seem to come more from the Raffae to Habenula current. At the same time, there doesn't seem to be a difference that we can perceive in the, in the, in the actual distributions of these directed interactions. And it's only later on that there may be some mechanism that changes these interactions and strengthens them, as is reflected by the blue histogram being broader than the red and the, and the black. So what have I told you today? I've told you two things. We have found a couple of mechanisms that are of interest that are being verified experimentally in driving this active to passive coping transition. So in the 2019 paper, we showed that habitual interaction strengthened with persistent inescapable adversity. And we found this unexpected feedback interaction from the Raffae to the Habenula. And you know we wrote that in the paper. What we have now found, thanks to this current-based decomposition method, is differential roles of different projections into a source area. In this case, I showed you an example of Raffae and Telencephalon projections into the Habenula. And some of those changes as a function of this experiential, you know, experience, uh, experience of this fish, there are some of these changes are driven by fast changes to the current manifold. And some of them are driven by, the, some of them could be driven by slow, more structural changes as manifested in the directed interaction matrix strengthening towards the latter half of the experiment, but not in the beginning of the experiment. So with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Once again, I would like to thank Dr. Perrick um, for, his, for his amazing work on this project. He's also on the job market. Um, and so, um, so, you know, all of you watch out. Camille Spencer Salmon, a grad student in my lab, and our ongoing collaboration with Tyler and Aaron in Carl Dyserot's lab.
I would also like to thank our funding sources for their faith in, in our ideas. And with that, I will take more questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Kanaka. Uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, is it possible that the apparent change of interaction strength is due to the change of some external unmodeled input? Totally possible. So that is totally possible. So I have, I have um, two answers to this, to varying degrees of, um, of, of we don't know, basically. OK, so, so the, the first of the I, I, we, don't, we don't know minimum level is the fact that these networks that I've shown you today also receive some kind of input, because we were curious. Since these fish are experiencing shocks, is this the same thing as something you know in the sensory processing of the fish that is changing? Or is there something in the directed interactions themselves? So we give all of these units in the network a square wave pulse, and we're also training the input weight. Those didn't seem to those, those didn't seem to change that much as with the experience. They have changed in other contexts in other data sets. So we know we're not insane, but they didn't make a huge difference here. And two, the direction is really, you know, we're kind of relying on, and again, I think uh, Claudia put it much better than I would, which is that we need to know area membership a priori. Um, and so what that what this means is that we're kind of relying on our experimental collaborators to tell us that, you know, for the general task, I have recorded from these three regions and these three regions are important. What we would love for this, this type of modeling framework to do is to be able to infer the thing that's missing. So let's say I, you know, have a completely randomly connected RNN module as the fourth module here. And then I say, OK, what, you know, what do its interactions need to be in order for this whole multi-region ensemble to explain X percent of the variance of the of the observed behavior or the dynamics or ideally both. And we haven't done that yet. Mostly because I don't know how. Hmm. Uh, next is, it, it was not clear how you take time varying interactions between areas into consideration in your model. Could you explain that a bit with respect to time resolution and integration times? Absolutely. For example, activity within an area may build up via integration or facilitation within one region, despite ongoing activity in other regions. Okay, this one too, we wanted to first see what you know an unbiased model like this can do. And so we didn't put those types of effects in. Right now, we are struggling with sort of two possible directions in which to go. One is, do we want to put different time constants on different regions and see if there's an effective time constant that emerges from these regions? And two, to your point, how much biological detail do we need to add in these models before we're not able to make any useful predictions? And those are both you know, open um, questions. The real and the practical way that we've looked at any kind of be, any kind of timing relationship here is, you know, this is a very long experiment, right? These experiments run from about half hour to an hour long. And so what we didn't do was to take one big RNN and fit it to the entire time course. Although, you know, I, I realize now that that's what it, it sounded like we did. And we do that for other, um, other types of data sets. What we do here is to chunk the experiment into successive epochs that are just long enough to capture the dynamical features, but still short enough that they can coarse grain the experiential state of the experiment that we're currently interested in. Then what we do is to train an RNN on the first epoch and use the trained J or the trained directed interactions to train the subsequent epoch and so on and so forth. So the way that we're doing this is that each, each of those epochs now gives us a J matrix, but there's now a sense of continuity in these matrices. And we have now assembled a third axis, which is now not just JIJ, but there's now a case dimension that is coarse brained over time. Now, what we want to do with this, we have no idea. What we would love to do with this is to be able to write down something that resembles the kinds of phenomena that you talked about. What is the real plasticity mechanism that the fish is undergoing or these interactions change as a function of time and like that? Right now, we're staring at these tensors. So the main inputs of the habenula are in the telecephalon. How do you explain that the changes are first observed in the Habenula and in the Habenula Rafe connections without any prior alterations in telencephalon Habenula connections? What is the main source of these alterations in Habenula circuits during early coping behavior without the involvement of the telencephalon? Honestly, we don't know yet. 
So these are the types of things that we're looking at. Because so so there's so what you're getting at is a part of a bigger problem that we're currently working on. And that's you know that's why we haven't put the second fish paper on bioarchive yet. Is that you know if you have 13 regions, really we're talking about 13 squared currents, right? And this is you know this is part of the question. And in today's case, this is why we narrowed the problem down to three regions. And even from the perspective of three regions, we're looking at source currents only from the perspective of the habenula. So we're looking at habenula, habenula, telencephalanta habenula, and graphite habenula. I don't know the answer to your question. So we don't know if, for example, there are, there are interactions in another part of the brain that may be driving these in, um, in a cascade, but those are exactly the kinds of changes that we're working on now. And another question asks, have you compared the inter-area interactions with functional connectivity? Oh, I like this question very much. Okay, so, so the functional connectivity usually involves doing something like DCM or Granger causality very, very powerfully. And in fact, Danny Bassett writes some of my favorite papers in the field. And that involves fitting that kind of model to the recorded covariance. So as I said in the very first slide, the covariance is N squared matrix. That's a cross correlation of the firing rates or the observed activity of everybody. And then you do, it's very informative. What that object gives you is everything that is on the manifold. What this exercise buys you, right? What the J matrix and these currents give you, because you're fitting the whole dynamical system, you get the covariance for free. It's actually in part of this minor sized work because you're getting all the activations right. You're getting the covariance for free. Therefore, you're getting the functional connectivity results for free. What you're also getting is dynamical stability, which means that any of the off manifold directions are also guaranteed to come back down to the system. And, and you know, in dynamical systems, the off manifold directions far outnumber the on manifold directions. So this is actually sort of, you know, a strength of the method in that, you know, fitting these types of um, RNNs should be possible wherever functional connectivity is required, really. So uh, I'm going to take uh, one last round of questions from the audience. And uh, while we wait for that, I have one question of my own. It's a, it's a slightly a bigger picture question. And I don't know if you have any opinions on this, but- uh, Can I the, stop the, sharing for this, by uh, the way? Sure, I think so. Because I just wonder that I can't see yeah. anybody and then it's a little, oh, there you go. Yeah. It's still uh, just me though then. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm going to turn on my video now. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah. So, this this learned helplessness paradigm is a little bit depressing to be honest like that uh, they go from active to passive so uh, uh, what is there a particular human disease well, yeah, depression. Yep. major yep. depressive disease in fact yep. so yeah yeah major depressive disease so in fact one of the things people see is that uh, so every animal has an active and passive coping transition it's an adaptive behavior really in my slide i should be retitling them active and passive coping rather than adaptive and maladaptive the onset point of the transition between them is advanced when an animal or a person has a tendency to lapse into something like depression learned helplessness is a phenotype that is seen in major depression but major depression has is so multifaceted and so rich that more, i am hesitant to use that terminology lightly but this is supposed to be kind of a, a an impoverished model of, of exactly that so let's say you know our toast burns or something right at three o'clock in the afternoon after like eight hours of zoom I, you know our winter our reaction would be oh the worst day ever but if a person has major depressive disease, and these are people that fetch up to Sinai for DBS, right? Mm -hmm. These are people whose lives are devastated. Those people will curl up fetal. Their movement shuts down for, uh, for as long as you change the context. So for them to recover, much like it takes the zebrafish, and in fact, it was one of the biggest controls in the paper, is that this is not like habituation. This is really a phase transition in which circuit-wide change is noticed. Like you have to take the person out of this fetal position and change the context in which they exist in order for them to recover from it. The same thing happens in fish. And yes, this is a, this is a condition that is seen a lot in, um, in models of depression. Yeah, would it be interesting at all to study sort of the flip side of that, that uh, it is actually possible to do something about the cause of your adversity so that you, uh, that the fish can learn some kind of strategy to prevent the shocks? 
So one of the things is closed loop, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. It's to yep. say, like, you know, if you if you enable the tail whip velocity to be coupled to the frequency, yep. then they will escape then they will try to evade yep. this. There are a couple of directions in the Dizeroth lab that directly speak to this. One is to see the effect of something like ketamine. The other is to really have something like a reshock. So, you know, I don't know if, you know, anecdotally, people that have, you know, seen a hurricane or something in their lives were much more resilient when I know, Hurricane Sandy blew through New York when it was, uh, you know, people, you know, Katrina survivors were much more resilient to, um, Sandy blowing through town, then, you know, I don't know, perhaps you and me when Sandy blew through town. And so there may be uh, what we think, and, and it's way too premature to hang my hat on it, there may be some kind of behavioral dichotomy between what is this pre-exposure and why it leads to this uh, bifurcation between some becoming resilient and some being uh, almost freezing early, like PTSD-like. Yeah. Um, and so the flip side of that does exist, but it's kind of harder to put because, you know, I mean, you work in this in this type of um, this this type of data sets, too. Right. So I don't want to just flip the valence of the experience trivially. And then um, but I'll tell you, there is a beautiful paper. Uh, Dob I want to say that Dobson is one of the authors who wrote about the exploitation, exploration, exploitation trade off in larval zebrafish and then you know network analysis of this which i think it should be like mandated reading okay uh, another question came in uh, it seems like the point where you decompose the input to a certain area say area a into components from other areas the a to a b to a and c to a current seems to be highly similar to constructing a highly compressed version of the j matrix that instead of mapping unit activity to unit activity maps region activity to region activity have you tried any other ways of doing this? Are there other ways, maybe like uh, SVD to compress J so that only the important parts remain? So it's a, this is a very good idea. We haven't. And that may, so this whoever asked this question, can you, if you could please circle back to us, this may be one of the things we can use to solve our combinatorics problem. So the only way that we have even gone after this region by region thing is to start to think about, hey, you know, the, these networks don't care what the time series are. So can we try to do LFPs or EEGs with them? But that's not the question you're asking. You're asking if there's a compressed version of this matrix that's possible, which will then help us solve our combinatorics problem. So I would love to understand more. We just haven't done it or don't know how. Thank you. I think. Um... Uh, that that's it for today. Thank you so much for this uh, inspiring talk. That it clearly elicited a lot of uh, uh, follow up questions and, and feedback. Uh, so it, it was wonderful to have you, Kanaka. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. and thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. Bye. So I just leave this now. Is that